Thank you very much, Mrs. Pile, for agreeing to give us this interview and for coming to the Graduate Institute to speak about uh, human rights investigations. Now, you have had a very remarkable career, which started in 1967 as the first non-white uh, women to practice law. And here you are in uh, this beautiful Palais Wilson. How did you manage this remarkable career? Well, let me say, since um, you know, most of the people watching this uh, video are students, that you don't think in, when you're a student that you're going to climb all these steps of the ladder. So one step at a time. And uh, growing up under apartheid, every child was aware of the injustice. You first saw the injustice to your parents. Uh, and so you, you cared because everything was a struggle. Um, but here I want to say um, how much we were motivated by students outside, international students. It really impressed us that they cared about ending apartheid. Um, and that's how uh, we started, how I and many of our colleagues. And I wanted to study law because I felt once you know your rights, you can assert them in, in any venue. Always you find that people, ordinary people looked to lawyers to explain what the law is. Everything was so complicated. Uh, and just to show you how much uh, the apartheid authorities discouraged us from thinking about rights and human rights, they did not allow any a prisoner on Robben Island prison except Nelson Mandela to study law. You can study anything else except law. Uh, so it's a choice I made then to study law uh, and to become a lawyer. And I, I was, I think, uh, so I was the first uh, woman of color to open my own uh, law practice. I was not the first non-white person to become a lawyer. And whether you liked it or not, all of us would add human rights practices because you saw poor people, you saw detainees. Uh, that, that was our daily work. It's not like we went out looking for, the, for that kind of work. It came looking for you. Mrs. Pile, I would now like to move to two countries where the situation is relatively sensitive. The first one is Afghanistan, and more particularly women in Afghanistan. Now, the Constitution changed in 2004 to guarantee equal rights to women, but we're still seeing some, some very terrible issues happening there. What, how do you see the situation going forward? What can be done? The um, situation about the human rights of women in Afghanistan is a matter of grave concern. It's something that I, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, and my office is watching closely. Uh, but let me say that before I became the High Commissioner and when I was a judge on the Rwanda Tribunal, I was asked by the United Nations to chair this huge group of Afghan women uh, who came out of Afghanistan and came from various parts of the world and they came up with a very go good uh, document on how they saw their rights. So this is Afghan women who determined what they saw as their rights. And there was no notion of something being Western or uh, uh, Af Afghan, Afghan uh, peculiar to Afghanistan. These, these are women who came from inside and outside. And therefore, I'm firmly convinced that there is a uh, understanding by the women of Afghanistan of what they want. They, they want equal rights, uh, they want to be treated with dignity. But Afghanistan has this long history, a very long history where progress has been held back. So I would uh, acknowledge that they need time to catch up. More recently, uh, when this um, Shia law was uh, passed, uh, there was a uh, tremendous criticism of that law from uh, civil society organizations and the media, which resulted in um, the, the president moving back with that law, but it's still not satisfactory. Uh, but these are the kind of endeavors I'm looking towards to push uh, 
uh, for progressive change. I acknowledge that it might be slow in the context of Afghanistan, but I respect what the women have identified as a, a society in which they want to live. The other country is Iran, and Iran is now being reviewed by the Human Rights Council as part of the universal periodic reviews. Do you think that this is the best forum for a frank and open discussion on Iran? Yes, well, you're quite right. As we speak now, Iran is uh, undergoing its uh, universal periodic review in the Human Rights Council. Uh, we never had such a mechanism before in history. This Human Rights Council and the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, is just about two years old now. The important principle is that states themselves review each other's human rights record and they make recommendations. There is the participation of civil society, NGOs from the country concerned, and NGOs from other parts of the world who may either make a contribution or participate in the proceedings before the Human Rights Council. And then the Human Rights Council has set up uh, the special procedures system. These are independent experts who are able to visit the country if they are invited or if not, they prepare an expert report. And then the High Commissioner prepares a, a report about the human rights situation of that country. In this case, it's Iran, but it applies to every state in the world. Now, that's a very important principle. It's not just a few states whose records are, are looked at which was the situation and the criticism of the uh, previous Human Rights Commission, uh, which was replaced by the Human Rights Council. Uh, I, I like the vision of this council, is to identify uh, the gaps where there needs to be improvement, where states themselves make recommendations, the High Commissioner makes recommendations, and uh, where the state's concern can ask for assistance, such as uh, the technical uh, cooperation and assistance that my office provides. So it's not just uh, a naming and shaming, it's not just a criticism, it's confrontation, obviously, because the other states are not slow, they confront the state's concern on where they have failed to carry out their obligations. We look at all the uh, conventions to which the state concern is a party, uh, the treaty bodies then also review complaints against particular states. So this combined mechanism I think is the best we have today and we have to make it work. We have to ensure that states take this process seriously. In my view they are doing that. In March we have the high level segment and there will be at least 20 uh, ministers some heads of state who will come and address the Human Rights Council. To me, that means they're sending a strong signal that they take the situation of, uh, of human rights in their country seriously. I would now like to move to the fourth World Congress on the death penalty happening next week in Geneva. What do you think the prospects are for universal abolition? Well, I think that uh, it's important that almost 140 countries in the world have committed to uh, abolishing the death penalty. And all, uh, 72 states have uh, ratified the optional protocol, which means that they are obliged to take on necessary steps uh, to definitely abolish the death penalty. So these are interesting developments. And more and more states are voluntarily uh, enforcing a moratorium on executions. So we have come a long way. Um, that some interesting, um, some very important judicial decisions on the death penalty also have an impact. Uh, for instance, in my country, the Constitutional Court declared the death penalty uh, contravenes the Constitution. Uh, there was a history of uh, South Africa being a country next to uh, Iran and the United States as, as a country that imposed the um, 
most number of uh, death penalties. This was under apartheid. So it's a dramatic change for my country. We see the benefits. We see the extremely valuable jurisprudence out of the Constitutional Court. I like to see this spread. It's true that the, uh, we, we don't have a, a convention um, which may, calls for universal abolition of the death penalty. There is a, a declaration calling for a moratorium. Definitely there is an agreement that juveniles should not be executed. And it pains me that some countries nevertheless do execute individuals who were uh, juveniles when they committed the offence. I have great hopes for this uh, conference. I'm very happy that it's being hosted here in Geneva and I will be addressing that conference. My next question is on business and human rights. Your office organized an important consultation last year, I think it was in October, with NGOs and business. And of course, Professor John Ruggie has been mandated to look at this topic in more detail. How do you see this issue evolving, particularly in light of some governments wish to see a mandatory framework? I, I recommend that uh, that framework be uh, adopted and looked at by the business world in particular. I know that at Davos uh, this matter was addressed. Um, very many businesses are introducing uh, human rights policies in, in the course of their business, which is so new to business. Business will always tell us that, that they're in the, in the business of making profits, and, but they cannot um, move away from the fact that they directly uh, impact uh, degradation of the environment, or, um, or in exploiting land for, for mines or, or uh, engaging in deforestation. They're impacting the human rights of large communities such as indigenous peoples or, uh, or in Nigeria with the exploitation of, of oil. So as civil society brings, it, brings all this to their attention, Business then clearly have a moral obligation, if not a legal obligation, to be engaged, to be in touch with the civil society organization and, and to address their concerns. Uh, years ago, I, in my involvement with the women's movement, particularly in Africa, heard from women how much um, Northern pharmaceutical companies, for instance, depleted their forests as they looked for natural herbs and so on, and, and then patented that. And the women then had to go deeper and deeper into the forest to look for the herbs that they l l traditionally lived on for many years. So there are many, many facets to the involvement of business. I think this is a very important initiative taken by John Ruggie in coming up with a definite framework. I was here at the meeting, which was attended by almost 250 individuals, almost half of them uh, representing business. They want to engage. They don't want to be on the outside of the process of having a human rights-based approach to business. My next question and my last question is uh, geared to a student who is at the Graduate Institute and um, looks to, to do a career in human rights. What advice would you give that student today? You know, what I want to say to the student uh, is in my lifetime, I didn't think that apartheid would come to an end. And we struggled so much inside our country. It was really oppressive. Uh, when I was at university, I, I was in a separate non-white section, which was a, a potato warehouse. And there were 13 of us studying um, uh, company law and bills of exchange, but there was just one textbook in that library. So you had one hour in the library, and you, re you read fast and you handed over to the next section. So what inspired us was, as I said earlier, uh, 
is that people outside cared, that particularly the youth outside cared about us and helped to bring down apartheid. Uh, I now meet people who were children in the 1970s and who refused to eat South African oranges in solidarity. Now, where does all this come from? It comes from young people, particularly students, caring uh, and, and, and uh, realizing that they can make a difference. Uh, and, and that's what I suggest, that they be familiar with uh, what's happening in, in the human rights world and the humanitarian world, such as Haiti now. And, 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 to, and their caring should take them to all these vulnerable communities. And, and they can strategize in so many ways. I do believe that every single student can make a difference. And in the process, they would be better people serving in whatever capacities they choose to serve. Well, thank you again, Mrs. Pile, for uh, this interview. And we very much look forward to seeing you next week at the Graduate Institute. Thank you.